Jesus is the good son. Our text this morning is John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon us this morning. We pray that you would illumine us through your word, lead us and guide us to understand it, and Lord, help us to do it. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On the evening of August 20th, 1989, Eric and Lyle Menendez, the adult sons of wealthy executive Jose Menendez, came up behind their parents sitting in the living room of their Beverly Hills home and shot their father and mother to death. The case was sensationalized in the media, and the two bad sons are currently serving life sentences for murder in a California prison. Unlike the Menendez brothers, Jesus is the good son who obeys and loves his father completely and is willing to obey his will all the way to the cross to save the world. This morning in John chapter 3, we'll see that the Son saves superbly. The Son saves superbly. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 14. John chapter 3, verse 14. And it says there, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now the context here is a conversation with a rabbinic leader, an elder of Israel. Here is a man who sits on the high council of the leaders of Israel, the Sanhedrin. His name is Nicodemus. Now going back to the verse right before the verse we have here, in verse 13 it says this, Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is saying he's the Son of Man. Jesus is saying he's the fulfillment of the vision of the Son of Man in the book of Daniel and that he's come down from heaven. The Son of Man who came down from heaven will be lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. Now you've noticed our Old Testament text this morning from Numbers We've got one of these cases where Israel, they were constantly complaining against God, constantly challenging the authority of Moses, complaining about their situation and the food that they'd had. And because of this, it was the very reason that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. If they'd been thankful and grateful and faithful, they would have gone right into the land. And so the people here begin to complain once again, and God sends poisonous snakes into the camp. And people are being bitten, and they're dying. And so we read these words in Numbers 21 and verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. What a strange thing. The people are being bitten by these snakes, and they're dying. And so God tells Moses... Make a bronze serpent. By the way, if you don't know what serpents are, they're poisonous snakes. Set it on a pole. And these people who are dying, when they look upon that bronze serpent, they receive life. These people who are under judgment look to the serpent and they're saved. Isn't it strange? A serpent? If you go across almost any culture, ancient cultures to modern cultures, you find that people are has a sense of revulsion with snakes. Snakes to us are something to be feared, something that's cursed. In the Bible, we see that the devil himself is associated with being a serpent. But here we see God ironically turns things around. Like the serpent, a symbol of evil and the fall, here it is reversed. The snake is lifted up on the pole and becomes a symbol for salvation. And what is Jesus saying here in these words to Nicodemus? I believe he's saying something similar. The Son of Man, the Son of Man who comes as the last Adam, reverses the villainy of the first Adam, and he likewise will be lifted up. And anyone who believes in the Son of Man will be saved from death to life. Let's go on to verse 16. And here we have perhaps the most famous verse in the entire Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
Now, we always concentrate on the portion of this text that talks about our salvation, the human-centered portion of this text. But notice that God's interested in saving the world. Only a good God would love a creation marred by sin and rebellion against him because he's a good, loving father. When he made these things in the beginning, he said on each day of creation, it is tov, it is good. And on the sixth day, when he made man as a capstone of creation, he said it's all very, very good. Not only did he love his creation, but he set about redeeming it so that justice and mercy are balanced. And to do this, he sent his son to be lowered. Not only did God speak about love, not only did God point to what good love is, God demonstrated his love by sending his own son into the world to be lowered, disgraced, murdered, but resurrected as a man. This motif of sons, of only sons, is all over the scriptures. And when you start looking for it, you'll find it all over the place, and it's pointing toward Jesus. We've got the firstborn son of God in the beginning, Adam, created in the image of God, created to grow and to see the entire human race sprout forth in perfection and to reign and rule over creation, and yet he fell. We see this only son motif again, where we see Isaac, the patriarch, sometimes called the quiet patriarch. He's capstoned in between Abraham and Jacob. And what happens with him? Abraham's waiting for this promised son. And when the promised son arrives upon the scene, God tells him, take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Sacrifice this only son. And at the last minute, he's saved by the ram in the thicket but it's pointing forward to the sacrifice of an only son in the future. We have the innocent son of David. David falls into sin with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant, and we've got this child that's to be born. And the law says that if anyone commits adultery, they should die. They should be judged. But David lived. Why? Because that infant son, that only son, took his place and died for him. Anyone who believes in the Son will not perish, but have eternal life, says this text, says Jesus. Anyone who believes in the Son will not perish, but have eternal life. Let's go on to verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God sent his Son into the world. God, the Father, willingly sent, and the Son willingly went. Why? Not to condemn, not to judge the world. Now notice here the context of this conversation is with a Pharisaic Jewish rabbi. He would have thought that God's Messiah was coming to judge and destroy the Gentile world. In his mindset, God's coming. He's going to send his Messiah into the world, and this Messiah is going to come just like David did. This great conquering king who is going to conquer the land and set it apart for righteousness. But we see in the time of the intertestamental period, another motif arrives upon the scene. We've got the Maccabees. The Maccabees. When the Greeks were ruling over Israel in the second century of B.C., they did wicked things. They came and brought their pagan religion in. They desecrated the halls of the temple, and so a priest and his family rose up, Judas Maccabeus, and they threw the Greeks off, and they reconsecrated the temple, and they cleansed the land. But in the mind of a first century Jew, we see that this idea of the Maccabees comes together with David, and that's what Nicodemus is looking for. We know that when Messiah comes, he's coming in righteousness. We know he's going to throw the Gentiles off and cleanse the land. He's coming in judgment, but Jesus says he's not coming into the world to condemn the world, but rather to save the world through himself. The Son came not to judge the world, but to save the world, and the world extends beyond a narrow Jewish definition. Jesus, the Son, is saving the whole world. Think about that for a minute. The Son is saving creation. Do you ever think about that? 
I don't think most Christians ever think about that. I think what they do is they look at this first and they think about people getting saved, but they forget that Jesus is bringing about the restoration and salvation of the created order itself. We see the Apostle Paul speaking of this. Creation groans under the weight of the fall. Creation is longing for the revelation of the sons of God. That's you and I on the last day when we're glorified and everything is set free and liberated from the fall. We see that even now, after the fall, thorns and thistles sprout up. Creation itself seems to be warring against us. You see that in your workplace, I'm sure. You see friction. Your yard right now, it's rained recently, and there's all these weeds that come up. We're always warring against creation. But Jesus came into the world not simply to save people, but to save creation itself. And the Son is saving Jew and Gentile together so that Russians and Ukrainians, Chinese and Japanese, Vietnamese, Afghans, Ugandans, Iraqis and Americans, blacks and whites can have peace with one another. Jesus is bringing this about in his salvation as well. Do you see how our culture is always trying its little secular ways, creating all these diversity and equity and inclusion programs, supposedly to bring people together to create one race, but instead all it does is creates all kinds of friction. Friends, we have the answer to all the frictions between the ethnicities and races. It's here among us. It's the Holy Spirit of God. The gospel brings about peace. The gospel solves the tensions that exist in cultures, and the Son is bringing the whole world into restored harmony with the God who judged them. Can I hear an amen to that? Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Whoever believes in Jesus the Son is not condemned, is not judged, but receives the benefits of the judgment that fell on him. You see, Jesus took the judgment, and that's the point of our text. There's no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus took the full measure of the judgment and condemnation. Took it upon himself as though he deserved it. He was perfect, but he took our condemnation, our judgment upon himself, and now there's no condemnation for you and I. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you're sitting out here this morning as a Christian and you're wondering whether you're forgiven of this sin or that sin, or if you've got some sin that keeps coming back and haunting you, then I say to you, stop it in Christ. But on the other hand, don't go back and dig up those old sins that you've already repented of and wonder if you are forgiven for those things, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and if you're a Christian, that's you. Jesus, the Son, doesn't bring judgment because the world is judged already in the fall. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, judgment's already there. We're judged already in Adam before we ever set foot in this world. We're under the sentence of original sin, and then we begin to work those sins out through our members. We're already judged But Jesus comes to remove that judgment. Jesus, the Son, is the way out of condemnation, the way out of judgment, so grab the lifeline. If there's anybody out here this morning that is unsure of their salvation, if there's anybody out here this morning and you don't know if you're a Christian or not, then I say to you, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and in Him your judgment's taken away. In him, your condemnation is taken away. So grab that lifeline. And for those of us as Christians, let's spread this message in our community. Going on to verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Light is a divine progression in the first creation. It is 
the first product of God into darkness. He said, let there be light. And the darkness has been moving back ever since. Let there be light. Think about this for a minute, friends. God creates and everything's dark and murky and chaotic. The planet is filled over with water and there's darkness. And then God says, let there be light. And we're told in John chapter 1, it was the sun, the sun, the second person of the Godhead who spoke forth, let there be light, and there was light. This was before there was a sun. This was before there was a moon. This is before there were stars. So what is this light? It's a super invigorating light of God. And that's why plants suddenly begin to sprout up, and the seas are filled up with fishes, and the land is filled up with animals, and then God creates man as the capstone of creation. Everything begins to live and to move in the light of God. Let there be light. Light came into the world in the first creation. And now light's coming into the world with the new creation of Jesus sitting there with Nicodemus. Jesus says to himself in the book of John, I am the light of the world. But we love our sins, do we not? We love our sins. Human beings love their sin, and so they like to hide in the darkness. You ever notice how people commit all kinds of wicked sins at night? They kind of know it's nighttime, time to sneak out and sin. But the light exposes the sin, and so we hate it. Nicodemus has come to Jesus in the darkness of night. He's come to the light of the world. Going on to verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Workers of darkness hate the light because light exposes sin. Now I want you to notice something here in the text. This will slide right under your vision if you don't know what's going on here. Verse 21, the first part. But whoever does what is true, but whoever does what is true comes to the light. I believe Jesus is turning the words of first century Pharisaic Judaism on itself. For you see, in rabbinic first century Pharisaic Judaism, they had a phrase, to do the truth. This is what they told each other. This is what they were supposed to do. To do the, the truth, to be a righteous person is to do the truth, a common rabbinic expression. But whoever does what is true, says Jesus, whoever does the truth, what? Comes to the light. Comes to the light. Jesus is challenging Nicodemus to come to the light. Jesus is challenging Nicodemus to come to himself. Think about the profundity of this. Nicodemus doesn't get this. We often don't get it either. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, literally, he is the light of the world. Not only does he bring light through his word, but he brought forth the first principle of physical light. Light emanates forth from God the Son. We see that on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's one of the points of that. Jesus literally is the light of the world. And when he tells Nicodemus here to do the truth by coming to the light, he's challenging Nicodemus, come to me, come to me. I'm the light of the world. Come into the light. Now going back to John chapter three and verse two, to backfill and wrap this all together with a bow, it says, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless you, unless God is with him. Here he is coming in the darkness of night. You think that was an accident? You think the predestinating hand of God? God, who made all things. You think that's not in his providence? God brought this about in a very specific way. He brought a teacher of Israel one of the elders of Israel, an elder man, one of the high statesmen of the nation of Israel. He comes to him at night, in the darkness of night, and here he's challenged to come into the light. Jesus challenges Nicodemus to come out of the darkness into the light, to come to himself. 
Jesus answers Nicodemus' implicit question here in verse 2. Not only do I do the works of God, the works of God, which are talked about as light, I do the works of light, but I am the light. And Jesus challenges you to live your life in the light, to know what God wants. And how do you know that? Kids, I want to challenge you. How do you know what the light is? Does God come to you? You pray like a lot of these charismatic preachers say, the Lord came to me last night. I used to like what Dr. Rod Rosenblatt used to say. He'd say, well, did he have a deep baritone voice? I doubt he came to you and spoke to you last night. He's already said what he wants. The Spirit comes and reveals it to you. The Word of God, which is spoken of as the sword of the Spirit. Guess what this is, kids? It's a lightsaber. It's a lightsaber. To know the truth is to know God's Word. And the Spirit comes upon us and illumines us. That's the classic terminology. Why? Because the light in the Word of God is revealed through the light of the Holy Spirit. And we see the truth. And we do the truth. And we become those who walk in the light and do the works of the light. Jesus challenges you to call this generation into the light, friends. Jesus saves. The Son saves superbly. Now, we've all lived through a time of extreme focus on salvation. Not salvation in the ultimate sense, but in the temporal sense. If everyone wore a mask, we could save 130,000 lives. If everyone social distanced, we could save all of our at-risk folk. And while safety as salvation is an important matter, salvation in the ultimate sense is a far, far more pressing matter. Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus was all about salvation, about how the only way one is saved in time and space and on the last day is through Jesus the Son. This morning in John chapter 3, we've seen the Son saves superbly. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us as the saved, as your people, as your adopted sons and daughters to walk in the light in this crooked generation. Help us not only to walk in the light, but to be light bearers, to shine the light into the darkness and invite many others to come and join us in the light. We pray that you would give us success by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in our time and place. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.